Okay, uh, thank you, Gianfranco, and thanks to the, the organizers. Um, so it's a you know it's been a great great meeting. This is a beautiful place. It's an inspiring place. So it's a, it, it's fantastic to be here. And so let me start by thanking the people who actually did the work. So this is mainly done by my um, PhD student uh, Karim Kerala. So he's been working on the project for about a year. And there was some startup work that was done by a master's student, uh, Chinmay Bendale, who was working on this project for maybe like a, a semester for me pro bono. Um, Botan Tukodi was a PhD student with Damian Vandenbroek, who worked with me w during his PhD, and he did a postdoc with me, a short postdoc for a year, and also much of this is due to him. And I also want to uh, thank um, Damien, uh, who, you know, this started as a collaboration with him. And I'd also um, like to say uh, I, I'm, I'm very sorry that he's not here. He's ill. He was supposed to be at the meeting. Um, but I'm very happy to have uh, gotten a little extra time from the organizers for in, in his stead. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about a, a pretty, what I think is a generic class of these disordered uh, materials. <coughs> that when we put them into shear cyclically, um, there, there are essentially three regimes of, uh, of loading amplitude. So at the lowest amplitudes, what you see is that eventually um, the, the material completely hardens, all the plastic deformation goes away, and I have something that's perfectly elastic. Um, at very large strain amplitudes, what you see is similar to what we would get in steady flow. Like you're basically yielding the material both forward and backward, and you see something at any particular strain cycle, like strain sweep, something very similar to what we would get in just forward forward steady shear. Um, there's a new interesting regime um, that I'm going to be talking about here where um, you're large enough in strain amplitude that you get non-trivial limit cycles at the end of the day. Okay, So the system is really trapped in some cycle. It's not diffusive. It's stuck. But in any particular single cycle, you do get um, rather uh, you know profound plastic ac activity in a, in, a, in a single event. So that's going to be the, uh, <coughs> the take home message. Okay, so just a broad overview of, these, of the kinds of materials I'm thinking about and the kinds of models we're going to use to describe them and what we think is going on. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, essentially any disordered system that is, uh, you know, the, the important ingredients are that it's athermal, so if I don't drive the system externally, nothing's going to happen. It will sit there forever. And uh, I'm really thinking, at least in this talk, about driving the systems quasi-statically. Okay, so it's rate independent. The applied strain is playing the role of some kind of time. And, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these systems could be, you know, uh, amorphous alloys, uh, colloidal glasses, um, other soft uh, soft glasses like emulsions or foams or granular packings. Um, this is a, you know, a typical um, uh, loading curve that you get. This is from Michael Denon's experiments on soap bubbles. And you see there the, the, the pronounced stress drops and avalanches that we've been talking about at this meeting. Um, so the question is, at a microscopic scale, what sort of mechanisms do we think are governing this plasticity? So these ideas go back to Ali Argon in the metallurgy community in the, the late 1970s. And Argon said, okay, so if I, if I have a glass and I'm loading it, what is taking the, you know, what is what is taking up the plasticity? What's the analog of the dislocations? And Argon said that well, there must be little sites where there are shear transformations. I have a cluster of particles that, for whatever reason, when I load it, they have a lower threshold than the rest of the material, and um <coughs> they slip. And even in this this initial paper in 1979, Argon was very clear that there are elastic consequences to that local slip. Okay, so if I have some cluster of particles that that um, rearranges to accommodate the load, what's going to happen? is you're going to get stress fields outside that look very much like you produced a little dislocation loop in this spot right here, okay? And of course, if we produce this dislocation loop, you're going to be loading the rest of the material surrounding it. And what Argon said that he would, what presumably would happen is you would get what he called autocatalyt autocatalytic cascades. And I think we would call these avalanches, right? So you have one thing triggering another thing and so on and so forth. And so these, the, 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 the cleanest experimental um, uh, example where you can see that is this is just a, a raft of soap bubbles. This is a, in, from a PRL by Abdelkader and Earnshaw um, from uh, 1999. And all they did, they took a soap bubble raft, they sheared it to, you know, whatever, so maybe 30% strain. Um, and what you're looking at, the, the, the bubbles by hand are colored in black if there's any topological change whatsoever. Okay, so he shears it this way, he colors these guys black, and essentially what happened is there was some cluster that slipped, they triggered the, the next guys, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, kinematically, what you have is a line of slip that's forming. And if you were to look at the stress fields, it would look like you just nucleated a dislocation loop, or essentially a, a pair of positive negative dislocations in two dimensions, where you have uh, this dipole, you have this edge dislocation, that edge dislocation. And so if you think about the stress fields that would come from that, as you have these guides gliding apart, you're going to have increasing stresses at the edges, and you're going to push the other guys over the threshold. Okay, so this is the mechanism for avalanches in these materials. <coughs> Yes, that's all I want to say about that. And so, of course, yeah, so these ideas from Argon have been imported into the statistical physics and the soft matter community by, you know, there's a long list of people. If your name doesn't appear here, I'm sorry. But really, in this community, um, uh, Guillemette uh, Picard, who was a PhD student with uh, 
with Lederich Bouquet and Armand uh, Arstari, um, really brought these ideas uh, to this community, thinking about uh, this, um, this stress transfer mechanism. Okay, so um, the topic that I'm interested in uh, today is what happens when we load these things cyclically and what do we mean by yielding, okay? Um, so there's some experiments that really motivate the way I think about this. So the first one, this is a, sorry, this keeps falling off. This is a soft matter paper from, um, I think, 2000, uh, 2014. Um, Liz Knowlton uh, with Dave Pine and Luca Cipolletti, what they were doing, they're looking at a microemulsion, they're doing confocal imaging of just a, a, single, a single plane. So you're looking down, they're shearing this way, so you're looking down into the, um, the flow vorticity plane, and what they're looking at, they're doing digital image correlation, and so they really have, you know, they're looking at the outline of the particles, the, the droplets, they see them move, and they actually get, by that digital image correlation, sort of voxel by voxel, they get a displacement field, okay? So they're measuring, they do this stroboscopically at a given strain amplitude, and after a full strobe, they look at the displacements that they see in a full strobe, okay? And so as a function of the strain amplitude, if they look at the sing, they wait till they get to steady state, they look at the single cycle mean squared displacement that they get for the digital image correlation, and what you see is that depending on the volume fraction of emulsion, <coughs> there is some critical strain amplitude where you get a big jump, okay? They identified the, the strain amplitude at which you get this big jump in the single cycle mean squared displacement as some kind of yielding threshold, okay? And they were looking at <coughs> the yielding threshold and how that depended on the, the volume fraction of the, of the emulsions, okay? There's another um, set of papers by um, Michel Kwa and Roger Bonnekes and their students where they were also looking at a similar system. This is a, a, a microgel, so this is a suspension of gel particles that are micron size. They, they, um, they can find them, and again, they shear them, and depending on the amplitude, at low amplitude, if you go back and forth stroboscopically, essentially nothing happens, right? So the system just is, is completely arrested. Um, if you increase the strain amplitude a little bit, at first it looks like maybe you're diffusing, so there's something different happening on each cycle, but eventually you go to a plateau, so there's no long time diffusion. And then if you go to a large enough strain amplitude, if you look over large time at the mean square displacement, it does continue to increase roughly the mean, the mean square displacement is linear in the in number of cycles, so you get something that looks diffusive, okay? So what I want to, I hope that you get by the end of the talk, there's something fundamentally different between defining a transition and diffusive behavior, behavior in terms of something that's a single cycle quantity and a long time diffusion, okay? And I'll show you that there's a pretty broad regime of strain amplitudes where you would, you would infer that something's yielded if you're looking at sort of single cycle quantities while it is not really diffusive. And that's because we can see reversible plastic events, okay? So in other words, if you go backward and forward, locally the system during one cycle will flip and then it will come back. And you can get into these complicated um, limit cycles where the single cycle measurement would tell you that you're diffusing, but the long time diffusion would actually be zero, okay? That's the take home message. Um, so people have looked at this more carefully in particle-based simulations, or particle-based um, simulations and soap bubble measurements. So this is some work by Michael Denon and Corey O'Hearn from 2008. So this is uh, essentially the same thing we were looking at, cyclic shear, but with soap bubble rafts. And what they saw is that they could get completely reversible transitions. So in other words, if they drove the system in shear forward and backward, so if you look at this cluster of bubbles here, you're driving forward and then backward, you induce a topology change in the network of contacts of the bubbles. Yeah, yes. No, 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 and I'll explain more later, okay? Yes. In fact, that's the main, that's the main point of the talk is that you can see, you, you see reversible hysteretic dissipative behavior, okay? So when you have irreversible diffusive behavior, that's, that's the transition to something that looks like this, where you actually have the particles diffusing, leaving their configuration, okay? But you can still have situations like this, where at any given cycle, you're actually dissipating energy and there is plasticity, okay? Okay, so this is what you see, the topology changes, but then it changes exactly, the particles go back exactly where they were, okay? So in the, in the simulation, the same, you can get the same thing if you simulate a small bubble raft where you have a topology change where the particles come back to exactly where they were. 
And if you look at the energy, you do see discrete drops. They're bursts. You're dissipating. There is hysteresis, but microscopically, you come back to where you were. Okay, that's the that's the important thing. Okay, you you don't just see this in small bubble rafts. So this is a this is a monolayer. So this is a, a, a 2D glass. These are polystyrene particles that are trapped at the end. So these guys are, th there's a bi-dispersed mixture of polystyrene particles that's trapped at an oil-water interface. And so this is work by Aikenkheim and Paul Aradia. And so they put a needle between two plates, and they're essentially inducing a shear flow in this two-dimensional um, glassy raft, okay? And they see, yeah, maybe. You guys need it, you need it for the recording? You need it for the recording? Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Good. So they put a needle and they drag the needle back and forth and they're inducing a shear flow that way, right? And so they see precisely the same thing that Denon saw in a smaller bubble raft where you go forward, you trigger topological change, you go backward and you can reverse that topological change, okay? And so what you're looking at here, they're essentially plotting the, the color is the non-affine, the local non-affine displacement. So this is just the displacement of a particle relative to its neighboring cage, okay? So if you go, if you're going backward and forward above the yield threshold, if you look at the system in the first cycle or the seventh cycle, so this is the non-affine displacement in one full strobe, you see these sort of slip lines that we saw in the Abdul Kader and Earnshaw bubble raft experiment that I showed you on the very first slide. Um, and as long as you're above threshold, you continue to see those guys in any stroboscopic cycle, okay? If you're below the threshold, below that critical strain amplitude, if you look at the first cycle, you still see these cascades, you see these slip lines, but as you, keep going, going in time, after many cycles, you've hardened the system, you've killed all the plasticity, okay? <coughs> so this is what you, what you see when you look at a single full strobe. So there's nothing there. But if you go in and instead of looking at a full strobe, if you look at a half strobe, and they count the topological transitions, what they see is that there are still a good number of topology changes that are happening in each half cycle but they're completely reversing themselves, okay? So um, to answer your question, this is plasticity, it's plastic. If you look rheologically, you're dissipating energy, but the system's not diffusing and it's coming back to exactly where it was, okay? And I will show you, so um, Ido Regev with, uh, well, this is my next slide. So Ido Regev with uh, Tarab Lukman and Charles Reichart showed that in particle-based, you know, kind of MD, zero temperature MD simulations, you can see the same thing, okay? There's a range of strain amplitudes where you're inducing um, microscopically dissipative um, top topological changes in the network. You're dissipating energy. But when you reverse, after some number of cycles, the system comes back to precisely where it was. Okay, so that's what you're looking at, just you know, the energy of the system. They're, s they're, 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 they're um, cyclically shearing. Eventually, the system locks into a periodic orbit. Okay? At low strain amplitudes, this orbit is always a one cycle. So you go backward and forward, there might have been some plasticity in each half cycle, but you come back to where you were after one full sweep. <coughs> if you increase the strain amplitude and you get closer to the threshold for yielding for actual diffusive behavior, what happens is the cycles become more complicated. You open up and you get n cycles. So the system doesn't close, it doesn't come back to itself after one full strobe. It's many strobes that it takes to come back to where it was. Okay. Um, and then finally, if you're above threshold, the system's just, uh, just completely diffusive. So my question was whether or not we could see that. So it's been seen in experiments. It's been seen in particle-based simulations. My question was whether or not in these, these um, mesoscale simulations that we heard Jean-Louis talk about, and that Ezekiel, I think, will talk about more after me, <coughs> if we take away the particles, can we build a model that still has this, uh, this, this emergent behavior in it, okay? And so what do we do for a model? So these are, you know, again, these ideas go back to um, Ali Argon. They were imported by uh, Picard into this community. So I'm imagining that I'm tiling my space into little elastic regions, okay? Each region has its own strain energy function. And the novelty here is that I'm taking the strain energy function for each of my tiles to be piecewise quadratic, okay? So I have, if I think about the stress-strain law for each one of these sites, I, I have perfect linear elasticity till I hit some threshold. When I hit that threshold, I essentially 
induce some plastic strain in my site, and in terms of an energy landscape picture, I hop into the next well, okay? I think it's, it's crucial for this model to see the reversibility that Regev saw in particle simulations. We need to take this landscape to be a, um, well, we need a landscape-based picture as opposed to the kinds of things people have done in the past, which is to stochastically redraw a new threshold each time you hit the yielding condition, okay? So that's an important component of what we're doing here. There is no stochasticity in this model at all. Each site has the same strain energy landscape as every other site, okay? So um, what we do is we, <coughs> we initialize the system with a dynamical quench, and each of these tiles I push till it plastic y plastically yields in the forward or reverse direction, and I repeat this process again and again until I get to some scenario where my, the variance of my stress field has essentially saturated, okay? And we take that to be, you know, in terms of the talk we heard from Ludovic yesterday, this is a very young glass that's not annealed at all, okay? So this is as violent a quench as I could imagine. So that's my starting point. <coughs> and then if we put this thing into steady shear, um, you see the avalanches that we've seen before, okay? So um, the, the other important point, um, since I have a uniform landscape, the plastic degrees of freedom, I really have an integer this model is an integer automaton. So I have an integer that tells me for each of these tiles how many times has it yielded, and that's it. Those are the only microscopic degrees of freedom here. Okay, so if we look at the initial stress field that we get after my quench, where I push each site forward or backward, um, we see there are some spatial correlations in the stress field. I think those spatial correlations in the stress field are important, and they're similar to what we would see in a particle-based simulation when we quenched it rapidly. Okay. So I have a reasonable starting point. And then if you look at the stress-strain behavior of this model, if I go and forward shear, I have a, you know, a pseudo-elastic regime. Of course, there is some plasticity. There are small events that are being triggered in this, in in this initial region right here. Then we get into a steady plastic flow where I presumably have this dynamic critical behavior and I have avalanches, okay? So there are a couple different ways that I'm gonna show you the data, so I'll, I'll go through that here. Um, I can either show you just the stress versus the total strain, or sometimes I'm, I'm gonna be showing you the plastic strain as a function of the total strain. And so here, where my elastic strain versus the total strain is essentially linear, my plastic strain is essentially flat, and then at some yielding point, my plastic strain takes off. The slope of this plastic strain versus total strain essentially goes to one, which means I'm in some kind of steady state. All right. So for, let, let me point this out. For this particular model, my flow state is about 0 0.42, okay? So I'm flowing. At a, at, a, at a stress that's 42% of the shear modulus. Okay, so I could, so now when I'm gonna, when I'm gonna cycle the system, so um, in this model, the total strain is really just a sum of the elastic and the plastic. So I could show you either the elastic strain as a function of the total strain or the plastic strain as a function of the total strain. So I could plot the elastic as a function of the total. And what you would see is a hysteresis loop that looks like this. So I start here, I load, I have an elastic branch. Nothing plastic is happening, okay? Then eventually I yield, I go forward, and eventually I yield. Or instead of showing you the elastic, I might show you the plastic, which is just a total minus the elastic. In that case, what you see happening is there's essentially no plasticity, then the plasticity turns on. I have plastic flow, this is elastic, then it becomes plastic. So those are the two different kinds of plots I'm gonna be showing you. Okay, now here's the data. Low amplitude, intermediate amplitude, high amplitude. And here I'm just showing you the, the, the integer values in my automaton, okay? So yellow means that it's flipped forward when I've sheared it forward. Blue means it's flipped backward when I sheared it backward. So you see at low strain amplitude, this is the plastic strain as a function of the total, what happens is everything goes away. There's no hysteresis, I'm not dissipating energy. In the intermediate regime, I collapse onto a little hysteresis loop. It's hard to tell from this movie, but I'll show you in the next frame something that's a little easier to get at. Well, I'll show you half cycle strobes. Um, there's still plasticity going on when I'm cycling forward and backward, but it's completely reversible. So when I go forward, every site that I flip forward will reverse when I flip backward, okay? And so it's crucial to have a non-stochastic model to get this to happen, to reproduce what we saw in Regev's computer simulations. Then, of course, when I go to very large strain amplitudes, what happens is the system completely forgets what's going on. I go all the way into yield. Each cycle, it's new, right? It doesn't really remember 
what happened the previous cycle. <coughs> this is, I think, just a clearer picture of what was going on in the last one. So instead of showing you the total values of the integer automaton, I'm just showing you what happens in either each forward or reverse half cycle or in each single full cycle. So what you see going on is you're if you're below threshold, if you look at a full cycle, everything goes away. But if you look at half cycles, you can be in a regime, you can be in a regime right here where you still see plenty of activity in the half cycle when you're seeing nothing in the full cycle. Okay? So this is precisely what um, Nathan Kahn was seeing in his bubble, in his um, polystyrene raft shear experiments, where if you look at a full cycle, what happens? If you look at a full cycle, nothing happens. But if you look at any half cycle, there's still a lot of plasticity going on. Okay? Um, did I lose my thing? OK, and then if we're far above the far above the threshold, what you see is that you can have some correlation within a full cycle. So if I go forward, I can produce you know, a slip somewhere in the system. And often, on the subsequent reverse cycle, that slip will go backwards. So the crack, the fault, will heal itself in a full cycle. Okay? So if you look at the full cycle strain, it tends to be less than any particular half cycle. So if I take the variance of these guys, it's a lot bigger than the variance of those guys. So I often have reversible things within a particular event. Okay, and we can look at this in terms of the, uh, <coughs> the macroscopic plastic strain rate. So if I'm below threshold, I see all the plastic strain rate eventually goes away after many cycles. If I look at the intermediate regime, I see I retain a plastic strain rate at every cycle. And finally, if I'm very, if I'm at a very large amplitude, not only do I have a non-zero plastic strain rate at every cycle, it gets to the value of one. One means I'm in steady state, okay? And as much strain, total strain as I'm, I'm injecting, I'm dissipating that plastically, okay? Okay, so now if we, if we think about the long time diffusion, so this is, um, you know, if you think about the two ways at the beginning of the talk we, we had in, in thinking about characterizing the diffusive properties, we could either look at single stroboscopic quantities or we could look at the long time diffusion. Okay, so this is the long time diffusion. So I'm essentially looking at the variance of that integer automaton, the strain field, as a function of the number of cycles. And what you see is that if the amplitude is low, not surprisingly, my mean squared plastic strain saturates. My plastic strain field just goes to some static thing. And my effective diffusion coefficient as a function of the number of cycles goes away. And so with a plot like this, I would not be able to differentiate the two cases I just showed you between the case where I have absolutely no plasticity or I have microscopically reversible plasticity. Okay? So there's a transition somewhere in here between these guys where there's absolutely no plasticity at all and these guys over here, where I lock into something that's microscopically reversible, but hysteretic. Okay? And then eventually, if I go to large enough strain amplitude, I get a transition to something that's honestly diffusive. The other way I can look at this is below the threshold. If I ask, how many cycles does it take for my system to lock into a either a null cycle, where there's no plasticity at all, or a limit cycle regardless of the period of the orbit. <coughs> That's this quantity here. So I have an ensemble here of 10 systems. We don't have a lot of statistics yet. But as a function of the strain amplitude, if I'm watching the number of cycles it takes to converge to some sort of periodic orbit, we see this thing taking off as you get towards that yield point. And so if I put those two plots together, this is sort of the money plot for this talk. Um, on the sub-threshold side, I have a diverging time scale in terms of the number of cycles it takes me to get to a periodic orbit. And then above that threshold, I have a decreasing diffusion coefficient as I go towards the threshold from above. Okay. So that's the main point. There are a couple other pieces here. but um, So again, three regimes, low strain amplitude. Eventually, all the plasticity shakes down to nothing. Intermediate strain amplitude. 
I lock into non-trivial limit cycles where I'm dissipating energy, but I'm microscopically reversible. So this is reversible plasticity. And then finally, at the largest strain amplitude, I'm diffusive. My system feels every time I go through a cycle as if it's brand new and young again. And there's very little persistence from one cycle to the next. Okay, thank you. So here's a, uh, okay. Um, the, in the loading curves for these samples that I prepared with a very violent quench, these would all be monotonically increasing. And so in terms of Ludovic's language of a, you know, a random spinodal, I'm way above TC, right? So there's no rapid transition at the yield point. Um, now the question is if I, so this is, this is just a picture of when I'm cycling near threshold. And you see the system locks into these very complicated limit cycles when I'm near threshold. And what must be going on is the system is somehow annealing. I don't know if it's the same kind of thing that you would get in a model like Ludovic's where you do the swapping and age a class in a mechanically unbiased way. But I would imagine that after I strain this thing for thousands of cycles at 50% just below threshold, if then I put it into steady flow, it would localize like gangbusters. No, no. If I were to put this system after I've cycled it many times below threshold, if I were to put it in steady shear, I'm almost sure that I would see a stress overshoot and strong localization. But I haven't done that yet. In particle simulation. Yep. Correct. That's right. That's right. So I'm, I'm not, yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so I, you know, I'll, I'll say that I'm, I'm not an engineer, but I play one on TV. And um, so I think the real engineers have something particular in mind when they talk about anelasticity. And usually, at least, you know, if there's anyone in the audience who can correct me if I'm wrong, please do. But to me, that's where you have recoverable, um, you know, it's recoverable usually by, you know, kind of some kind of thermal means, right? So if you, if you cycle, okay, and if there's some residual plastic strain after the cycle, if that's somehow recovered, not necessarily mechanically, right? So I don't know if they, when, when people use the word anelasticity, I don't know if they're thinking in terms of, you know, trajectories of microstates. I think they're, they're thinking more in terms of some kind of annealing, like some of these guys will, will, will come back. Some of that, some of that um, you know, the, the, the back stress that you induce will be thermally healed. At least that's my understanding when, when people talk about anelasticity as opposed to reversible plasticity. We do not, s yeah, so these are very rapidly quenched, effectively rapidly quenched samples. So in those samples, we don't see any shear banding. So if we were to somehow anneal to the, to the point where we did not, not in this particular model, we don't see that. So yeah, so, so initially I would have expected to get localization. So here, okay, so I've got my dirty laundry slide. Where's my dirty laundry? Sorry. 
Okay, this is, this is the dirty laundry slide. Okay, so if you guys saw me give the equivalent talk last year at KIPP, the punchline would have been different. And so in the stochastic model, where you're redrawing thresholds every time, what happens is, oh no, this isn't playing. What happens is if you're just above threshold, eventually you do localize, but only after a large number of cycles, okay? This is with the stochastic model. With the landscape-based model, we just never, you know, as long as we quench the system rapidly, you don't see localization. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a subtle thing. <coughs> the strain has to be kinematically compatible. So I'm imagining that there's an underlying displacement field and the sites are coupled to each other by virtue of the fact that my strain is coming from a gradient of some displacement, okay? So that's how these sites interact with each other. Precisely. So if you want to think about it that way, I solve the energy minimization problem subject to the fact that the strains are coming from displacements. No, here it is. That's it. This is the kernel. Um, well, so it's like a Martin site. So the model is almost exactly like a Martin Siddick model, except you can keep going, right? So I can keep straining. So I have infinite number of variants that have more, that have bigger and bigger strain, right? No, no, no I'm saying in a, in a, in a, in a Martin Siddick model, I'd have a double well, right? And it would just be convex outside that double well, right? So I'm saying in this model, it's like a Martin site. It's, it's precisely, if I, if I limited this, to plus or minus one, it would be Martin site. It'd be precisely the same model that Jim, Jim Sethman and people use for Martin sites, right? But here I'm not limiting it, it can just keep going. Boop, 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 boop. So, so when, you, when you say metastable, it's like, it, to me, it's a thermodynamic kind of thing. I mean, this is a micro, so I don't, I don't know about metastability here, since I'm thinking about a finite system, but uh, I don't know, okay, we can. We, we can talk about it, yeah. 